This is the 1980s. We're no better off than we were in the 1930s. But quite honest with you, in the housing conditions. The Divis Flats in West Belfast, Northern Ireland, opened in May 1968, by 1972 called the youngest slum in Europe. Well, it's just disgrace, like the flats were built in the first place, like, because I had really no childhood. Hardly anyone on the estate has a job. Nine out of ten adults are on the dole. One in three families are single parent. All are Catholic. But Divis is not just another decrepit housing estate in a declining industrial landscape. It's a Republican stronghold in the divided city of Belfast. If something has happened in the last 18 years of the Troubles in Northern Ireland, it will have happened here. Divis has become a byword for violence and for Republicanism. There's not a home that hasn't been hit by the Troubles. Fathers, brothers, you name it. To outsiders, especially to Protestants, to Unionists, Divis symbolizes bandit country. It's a place you'd never go near. It's a place you'd be terrified of finding yourself stranded near. It's a nightmare world, which they know of as a backdrop to violence, which they think of as a, a reservoir of, of terrorism. There's been a lot of deaths in the estate, violent deaths. There's been people shot dead. There's been uh, bombs in the area. There's been young children killed. Um, the estate is under 24 hour surveillance by the British Army from the top of the Devil's Tower. They can see in the every flat in the complex. The soldiers are as much a part of life in Divis as the families themselves. I was afraid nearly every day. You can never turn around and say you're, you're not afraid out there. If you turn around and say you're not afraid, that's when you start making mistakes. At last, after a 15-year campaign by the tenants, the dreadful enclosure is being pulled down. Divis has stood both as a symbol of the troubles and as a symbol of the mistakes of 60s housing. Demolition will mean the end of an era. I don't know what it's like to live in a house with a garden. You know, to me, that's, you know, it's like living in Beverly Hills, you know, living in a house with a garden. Twenty years ago, the housing conditions in Catholic West Belfast were appalling. It was estimated that one third of the homes were unfit for human habitation. In the hope for something better, few argued against wholesale slum clearance. What seemed to be the solution in 1968 was the low-rise, high-density concrete construction of the Divis Flats. Christine Irvin was one of the first tenants. When I moved into Divis first, I thought it was brilliant. I'd, the children were all young then, the boys were young. We only lived in two be, a two-bedroom house. And so when I moved to Divis, I had four nice big bedrooms, bathroom. You know, we only had outside toilets and no bath facilities, and it was just great. But the delight was short-lived. Fundamental design faults and poor maintenance created new slum conditions. Now the families just want to get out. The saying on the estate is, out of hell there is no redemption, and out of Divis there is no transfer. This turns out to be true for the Walls family. Hello, Miss Walls. Hello, Hello Daniel. How are you? Now we've got to see how this little girl is. How are you keeping? You've had a bit of jaundice, I believe. Let me have a wee look at your eyes, love. Uh -huh. Yes. Have you any pain here, look? Danielle is suffering from asthma. She's had it now for a few years. She's been attending hospital. And uh, living here, as they do in Divis Flats, she gets the exacerbations, the chest colds, all of which, of course, are detrimental to her as asthmatic condition. Have you had any word from the housing executive like I'm on this? Transfer this from the house That's right. And I don't seem to be getting anywhere at all with them. She's had this, the asthma for, for years. Mm -hmm. The jaundice, of course, is, is, is a new thing here. Well, all I can say is it's an absolute disgrace. I mean, well, as you know, we've written many letters to yes. them and I've phoned them. And uh, we just have to keep the pressure up because it, it is a disgrace that you have not been rehoused. 
and I told you would accept that. I would say, if, if I was asked, well, what is the, the main sort of reason why people would come to me as a doctor with David Slats, I would say it would be depression and chronic anxiety. I'm thinking of the, of the mother trying to rear children in a sort of concrete jungle like Divis, uh, a jungle that, you know, is, is more fit for animals than for human beings. An army of insects, cockroaches and rats take advantage of these conditions to spread disease. The strain of coping with life in Divis shows in the number of adults on tranquilizers, 68%. The constant presence of police and soldiers creates less of a home, more of a battleground. Injury and death are commonplace for all who enter. Over the years, um, soldiers have been killed in Divis in various ways. Um, they've, been, they've been bombed, they've been shot, they've been killed on the walkways, they've been killed at the lifts. Um, they've been ambushed from a distance, they've been shot close up. The fact that the place is almost a, a textbook example of um, a design for urban guerrilla warfare didn't help. As you're walking along, all everything around you is a death trap. There's corners, which can be uh, hidden booby traps, bombs. Uh, every window looks onto you, which could have a gunman uh, there, which you wouldn't see unless the shot rung out. I mean, the whole thing is dangerous, it's a death trap. The kids won't hit you or nothing, they'll spit on you. But the teenagers will lash out on you and they will chuck bricks at you. And they're the ones you've got to watch out for. They're the ones who'll chuck uh, little bottle bombs they used to throw at you. And you couldn't uh, lay a finger on them for it. Many times I wanted to grab hold of one and take my frustration out of him. But you just couldn't do nothing. You had to turn a blind eye, couldn't say nothing. You just had to carry on patrolling and ignore it, which is uh, very hard. August 1969, at the beginning of the present troubles. In Belfast, Protestant gangs went on the rampage, burning down Catholic homes. Hard on their heels came the RUC and B specials spraying indiscriminate machine gun fire from their armoured trucks. Sheltering from the bullets in their flat in Divis was the Rooney family. Nine-year-old Patrick was to be the first victim of the troubles. When the shooting got, started to get heavy, I ran upstairs to get the kids all in the one room. I panicked more or less to get the kids in the one room. And the bullets came down through here and right into the cloakroom and right out straight out the back to the working kitchen and Patrick was standing at the wall and he just slid down it and I thought he had fainted and I lifted him up and the, the blood was all gushing from the back of his head. As far as Englishmen, it didn't care who the, the maimed or who killed, they, they meant to, they meant to uh, kill somebody at as far as Englishmen. If he had been out throwing petrol bombs, rioting or anything like that, but getting shot in his own house, I did feel better, and he was my first son. Like, we moved away to try and forget him. You still don't forget, like, after so long, yet you try to live with it, but you never forget it. And to see that they got off with it, it makes you more better, like. He was just a child then, and thought he was my child. He was my child, and I don't forget. A nine-year-old boy shot dead by the police in his own home. The reputation of Divis was being cast. The newly formed provisional IRA was to find the estate a fertile recruiting ground for sympathizers and volunteers. The reaction generally to Divis, I suppose, dates from about then too, that people outside Divis and outside Catholic areas began to see it as a, another word for an IRA stronghold. Um, and who, who then projected their own fear and hate of the IRA onto Divis in particular. In August 1971, a dawn raid on Catholic areas heralded the start of internment without trial. Divis tenants were among the first to be arrested. Christine Irvin remembers how that morning affected the families left behind. On the 9th of August, they were all taken away, took down to an old disused yard in Albert Street, in their underwear, taking out of their beds at small hours of the morning in their underwear, 
and taken away, and that was the last, taken away and put in long cash. Once the army moved in, um, repression as ever bred more activity, and the army's presence here at all was seen as um, an affront, as provocation. People were felt very, very bitter at the time, naturally they would, like, husbands and brothers in a way, and, you know, their wives left the three small children and fathers mm -hmm. taken away. You know, everybody was so boiled up with anger, you just, you had to do something. You had to go out and defend the area, because the British, the British troops in the IEC were coming in and they were, they were just harassing the people and you had to do something about it, you know. Every young fella I know was out doing something, you know. In July 1975, the inevitable happened. Christine's third son became a victim of the Troubles. 16-year-old Charles Irvin went out in an old car he'd saved up to buy. Well, I never seen Charles alive again. We left the house. That was the end of Charles. Apparently, he was driving about and his car was backfiring. And a foot patrol seen the car and heard the backfiring and had had him followed. And he went through the checkpoint and never stopped. It wasn't a checkpoint, it was just a random checkpoint. And they said he was he had been shooting at them. And he was shot dead. And it was hard to cope with. I still haven't coped with it. I still haven't come to terms with it, really. Like, something you don't come to terms with. Just one of those things, like... Like, I'm not the only mother in Belfast that has had heartaches like this. I'm angry and bitter, you know. I wasn't brought up to be angry and bitter. You know, my mother brought me up to, you know, to live a normal life as best as best we could, like, but if anybody's made me angry and bitter, it's the British Army and the IUC. That's their country, and we're out there invading their country, and they don't like that. They're fighting for something they believe in. I respect them for that. But, but also, I'm doing a job which I don't choose to do myself. It's something I've got to do. I've been told to do it. And I, I just, I'll get angry when they react to us the way they do. And, he, and small kids, the way they react to us, it makes me very angry. And it still does to this day. It's not their fight. They're young. They come from unemployment black spots in, in England, Wales and Scotland. Everybody here knows that. And especially here, uh, I think, when you, when you watch anyone coming in here, the, the backdrop is depressing and unnerving. It must be it must be appalling for them. But they do come in carrying heavy, heavy guns, and they are seen as intruders and treated accordingly. Divis is at the bottom of the Falls Road, just yards from the 12-foot high wall that separates it from the Protestant Shankill Road. In 1975, religious assassinations were at their height. By the autumn, there had been 200 sectarian murders. My husband uh, used to come home from work, but before he would have come in, he would have called in the bar. Well, I'm standing that Tuesday night making his tea, and a wee boy run in and says to me, your husband's shot, but he's not dead. Now, that's how I got word about him. It was loyalists, for they got somebody for it. About 10 years after it, they got someone for it. Though they didn't go to shoot him you know, just him. It was for anybody It was in the road, but they just kept shooting all around the bar. It was on the, uh, the 4th of March, 75, he was shot, and he died on the 27th of May, 75. Well, he lived 11 weeks, and if he did live 11 weeks, it was like a skeleton when he died. In these flats, death has become a way of life. No family is untouched by the violence of the Troubles or the brutality of the surroundings. 33 tenants and five soldiers have been killed here. Mm. 1980, and the conditions in the flats had got so bad that the Tenants Association put demolition firmly on the agenda. Absolutely nothing whatsoever will satisfy the people of Devis Flats except the complete demolition the raising to the ground of this stinking, damp, rat-infested prison, that's the only thing that'll satisfy the people of Devils Flats. 
but the authorities would not deliver. If the flats were demolished today, there would be nearly a thousand families needing homes in the morning. Where on earth are they to go? There are already over 2,000 families on the waiting lists for West Belfast. Well, there were years when the housing executive and the Department of the Environment stalled and said they couldn't do anything and that they shouldn't do anything and that the faults weren't irre irremediable and that they, they weren't unlivable with and that if people took greater care of the environment, etc., the place ought to be basically all right. And for that, I think they must be, they must be culpable. So the tenants took the law into their own hands and formed the Divis Demolition Committee. When a tenant moved out of a flat, the Demolition Committee moved in, disconnected all the services and made the flat uninhabitable. Two committee members ended up in court, charged with criminal damage. They pleaded guilty, but the judges summing up shocked Belfast. It is terrible that I have to sit in a court in Northern Ireland and hear about houses which are overcrowded, damp, and rat infested. It is time something was done about Divis Flats and soon. He let them off with a warning. Nineteen eighty one and the height of the hunger strike riots in Catholic Belfast. In this atmosphere, a newly formed Republican army, the INLA, flourished in the Divis. A few months later, in an attack on an army patrol, the INLA planted a bomb on a balcony. But three boys were there too. Only one survived. Felix, brother of Patrick Rooney, the first victim of the Troubles. As we got on to the balcony, it was a football patrol standing on the balcony, the army. And Cam Valley just came behind us, and, and then that's when the explosion went off. And I was blowing up the balcony. I was dazed and shocked. I was asked to identify Stephen Bennett to see if it was him or not. I, uh, I couldn't believe it was him because he was so close to me, you know. I couldn't believe he was dead. And uh, Kim Valdi, he was just laying down, but he didn't die right away. He died a few days later, I think, in hospital. It was pointless, so it was. It really freed me, like. That's what the... Because you like the universe think anything, you know there's troubles like, but you never think you're going to get hurt or anything or anything like that. For the mothers of Divis, this bomb was a turning point. They didn't want their homes used as a battleground anymore. In a spontaneous demonstration, they called for all the gunmen to be driven from the estate. The mothers had endured 13 years of violence and had brought up a whole generation of children who did not know peace. Today, the Troubles are simply part of the children's everyday school lessons. They write about their lives as other children do, but their message is unique. The miracle in Devis Flats. One day, the people of Devis Flats had a meeting. They were all sick of living in a place where there was no peace. They decided to, to obey the Ten Commandments. They were all talking about keeping Devis like heaven, where it be no stolen cars or joy riders. There will be also no fighting at no army in the Devis Flats. We are not going to say any more bad words ever again. And there might not be any more bad people who go around and kill other people. There are no more bad words, no drinking, and also no riots. People will not jump off the Devis Tower and all the other flats in Devis. We will all start living new lives, and so they did. One day, a reporter came into the Devis Flats and found out that in the Devis Flats there was peace and quiet. Soon in every newspaper in the world, it was written on the very first page. Right, we've listened to the story of the, the miracle in Devis. What other changes would come about if everyone decided to take the commandments as they were and to live by them? Maureen, Holland. It really is, uh, I suppose, in a way, a haven for the children and an oasis for them. 
Uh, they come in here, there's the regular teachers, the regular timetable, and it's been the nearest to normality, I suppose, that they have experienced. Well, what you probably think that we're living, the situation we're living in is abnormal, but we've become so used to it, you know, we don't really know any other form of life. And I think we are normal. <laughs> I think life is normal here. <laughs> People have always talked about this place as though it's a prison. Um, unconsciously, I, I remember a man saying to me once, I've done 11 years here now. I must be due to get somewhere else by now. Well, it's been called it's the worst housing state in Western Europe. I don't know if that's true or not. I think it must be one of the worst. It's just, I mean, you only have to look at it to know what it's like. When you come in and look around a place, the staircases are all broken. Dampness, there's no street, no lighting in the, on the balconies. It's a haven for joyriders and glue sniffers. There's absolutely no facilities for children here. Then you've young mothers living in balconies trying to negotiate stairs with um, maybe a toddler, a baby in a pram and two or three bags of shopping. And there's absolutely nowhere for kids here. So it resulted in kids sort of playing anywhere they basically could in and around the area. In 1983, the lack of anywhere safe to play resulted in tragedy. Betty McLennigan rushed to this spot one February afternoon when she heard that her four-year-old grandson was missing while out playing. She met her daughter Christine there. She says, my wee boy's in that hole, he's under the water. And the next thing was she passed out. But they went and they got the frogmen and everything and they must have worked for hours, you know, trying to get him, but they couldn't get him. There was no sign of him. I think it must have been about 12 o'clock when I got his body. My daughter never got over it. She had a miscarriage after that, and then she took a massive brain hemorrhage. And she's really never been the same girl, you know, from what happened. She don't think she'll ever be the same again, like, to be quite honest. I don't think really any of us got over it, you know, for it was an awful tragedy. And he was such a dear thing. March 1987, and the Dines family are the last tenants to leave the latest block to be demolished. They have lived here the full 19 years. It's the worst place for anybody. They say that every, everywhere is bad, but I couldn't see any place as bad as this. I wouldn't put a dog in here. Well, I'm really delighted I'm moving there because this place has just got me down completely and we're delighted that we are moving tomorrow. I suppose we're not realise how happy we'll be to be moved to get out of here. The 60s experiment with system-built flats is over for the Dines family, but not the remaining tenants who must wait for new homes to be built. When accused of causing their own surroundings, the tenants turn the blame back on the housing authorities. They're the people that's responsible for building this complex. They put the people in here, living on top of one another, no privacy whatsoever. As you can see by the estates that's been going up around this area, if you give someone somewhere to live that they can take pride in, they will do it. Everybody that lives in those estates all lived in Divis Flats, but they've got a home now that they can take pride in. It was almost too late to feel relief. It had gone on for so long. You couldn't feel pleasure, really, because at the thought of how many people had had been forced to put up with these conditions for that length of time. In a way, the Residents' Association's fight is, is only beginning now, because we want a say in our future. We want a say in what is to replace Davis Flats. It should never have happened in the first place. 
if there ever was a good reason for, for this idea, this wasn't the time and this wasn't the place. Here, it couldn't have been anything but the disaster it was. That's the best thing they've done in Northern Ireland is to pull them divvies flats down. <laughs>